What was? Are we on air? Yeah. No, your audio is. My audio is well, lovely. Boom. Hang on a second. And we're working to get the program started, folks. Hey, and there we go. Welcome, everybody, to another exciting episode of the How Do You Know program and brought to you by the Star Mentor book. If you are an aspiring astronomer or you have an aspiring astronomer in your life, highly recommended. Uh, essentially, 40 years of astronomy education experience teaching uh, people who are beginners just getting started into astronomy, uh, just like you and I'm sure a book you will enjoy. Now, let's get ready for episode number 76. And this is one of those weird rabbit hole sort of episodes, friends. Um, I saw on Science News uh, websites that NASA had released there. Uh, I see Book Davies has joined us. Welcome, Book. Thanks for joining with us again. Um, NASA released this exciting document, their Mars to Moon strategy document. <clears throat> how are we doing? How are we going to get from here back to the moon after an absence of half a century and then go on from there to Mars and other manned exploration in the solar system? And I got this document. I'm like, wow, that looks interesting. That might be worth some time on a show, maybe like an introductory thing. And then I got to reading it, and I'm like, dang it, this is going to take, this is, this is something people need to hear. And an audience like ours is passionately interested in. NASA refers to this as a blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration throughout the solar system. So if you've been here over the last half a century and you're interested in, uh, um, exploration of the solar system, essentially since 1972, um, outside of low Earth orbit, it's been all robots and uh, spacecraft. And we have done some astounding things, not to take anything away from the really, really brilliant people, uh, NASA, ESA, JAXA, <laughs> Ross Cosmos, all those, uh, and the Indians now have their own space agency in Spain, just announced. Uh, they're going to have a, they have a space agency now. So the space community is growing, but it's all been robots, satellites, and spacecraft. NASA says, let's make a blueprint to get people back into the space exploration game, manned space exploration because I'll guarantee you, no matter how good the rovers are, a trained astronaut on the surface of Mars or the moon in 90 minutes can do as much science as a rover can do in a year. It's just people are better. So when I got looking into this, art, this document, really two interesting things. It's divided up into two major pieces. The first piece is how they think. NASA really is like, let's put all the cards on the table with this document. It's astounding to me, friends. Um, 
basically we're looking at a situation where NASA is telling you how they think, how they plan, all the organizational idea based thinking that you and I as space fans never see. And that's what I wanted to go into this week because it's very enlightening. And then next week we'll have a follow-up program episode 77 on the Mars moon to Mars strategy plan on the science that they're planning on doing. So let's go ahead and get started. And on the very first page, the very first page of this, um, I must admit my expectations were not terribly high when I downloaded this for, uh, it's, it's like almost 80 pages. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, I wasn't expecting this to be an exciting read. And yet in the very first page, I'm like, wow, um, this is stuff you don't usually hear coming out of NASA's spokes office. Um, but they start off and they say, first of all, the space economy is real. And the space economy now has the ability to do things that were once just the province of governments, which is astonishing. And NASA often competes one way and another with private companies, uh, satellite launch facilities, various other things. And uh, these other companies come in and they're showing great promise and great capability. And NASA says, you know what, this is really good because space exploration is a lot more cost effective now. The cost of a kilogram to orbit, uh, material to orbit has come down. The cost of satellites, the capability per kilogram you can pack into a satellite, the amount of sensor capacity, data crunching, computer capability, uh, analytical scientific capability you can pack into a kilogram of material going to space has really increased uh, hundreds of times over the last 50 years. It's, it's amazing how compact and efficient things have become. We use far more off the shelf technology. It's interesting because I there's a quote that we'll get to here from James Webb talking about the Apollo program that just stunned me. But this is something that occurred to me. The document mentions the use of a lot more off the shelf technology, everything from satellites, rovers, spacecraft. Uh, we use off the shelf components a lot. In the 1960s, when we were first going to space, going to the moon, we were inventing all that stuff an item at a time, and we were manufacturing them one off. Nothing was designed at the end of a production line. It was the end of a craftsman's bench. Um, and NASA basically says, our global partners. <coughs> NASA basically acknowledges that they are part of the world space exploration community now. And it's not a one or two country competitive mode, but a lot more collaborative now. Uh, and NASA says, quote, thus, we will return to the moon together uh, through international and public private partnerships. And then it's on to Mars. So basically, they're painting a pretty rosy picture. Yay, we have partners in private industry. We have partners amongst other governments and we're going to go to the moon and then to Mars. Um, they talk about returning to the moon to stay as members of a permanent lunar scientific base. And I think of this along the Antarctica model uh, where Antarctica, no one goes and uh, operates a base for their own profit. The continent is owned kind of uh, uh, in trust and people establish bases there for scientific work and they work as a community. Uh, NASA is basically envisioning much the same thing here, going to the moon in an Antarctic model with different uh, companies and countries will have different bases uh, there to do science. They refer to the moon to Mars strategy document as the M2M. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is they say that it's not weighted in favor of returning to the moon or 
humans reaching out to Mars. This document says the Mars to Moon protocol embraces the need to do both, to not only go back to the moon, but to go beyond to Mars and to reach out humanity in the solar system. Their quote from the document, humanity needs to learn to adapt, live, thrive, navigate, produce, and prosper in each new domain, which then prepares us for the next. From the dawn of time, this has been humanity's exploration tactic. And so they're basically laying out the groundwork there. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to use the moon to develop all the transportation, logistical, uh, food, growing food uh, in there at the time, all these sorts of things. Hello, Mr. Dog. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, yes, I, I see you. You're a very good boy. There, you can have a snack. Off you go now. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, basically they're saying, you know, as humanity is spread across the globe, so we will spread through the solar system. It's kind of a Monroe Doctrine sort of a statement, and I like it. Let's go to space. Let's become the first uh, interplanetary species. Moon, the moon, they say, will be a proving ground for technologies and capabilities needed for humans to reach, colonize, and thrive on other worlds. Then the document gets into some interesting things, and you start to realize, wow, this is NASA telling us how they think, how they plan. And you think about it, NASA is this agency of a fairly powerful government, which has, um, let's just say, fluctuating political leadership. Yeah, let's, I think we can say that, fluctuating political leadership. And it's polarized. So one group gets in and says, oh, the other group wanted that. Well, we're not having that. And so projects tended to get started under one administration and then flounder under the next. And NASA's been suffering under that lash for more than half a century since before the days of Apollo. And um, basically, then we get into James Webb, for whom the town, he who for for whom the telescope is named. Webb, a NASA administrator, said, Apollo was much more a management exercise than anything else. I looked at that statement and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. And he claimed, to be fair, he claimed this in retrospect, that all the technology needed for Apollo was, quote, largely within grasp at the time of the 1961 decision to go to the moon. Ah, uh, <laughs> I don't know that that's true. I don't know that I even believe that's true. Uh, I think we invented a lot of stuff on spec to go to the moon. But Webb says we have all the technology. Um, basically, I think as I look more into this, I think he's talking about all the technology being in-house, that is in the U.S., at that time, remember 1961, when we're first talking about going to the moon, it's a competitive race with the then Soviet Union, the other global superpower. And so it is this uh, task to beat another nation in scientific and uh, political accomplishments. And NASA has access to all the technologies they need in the United States. They don't have to go anywhere else. They don't have to recruit anyone else. They don't have to shop anywhere else. They've either got it here or they can make it here. And so today, it's not so easy. Today, we have a much more diverse exploration community. We've got partner and, oh, so uh, Book says, I'm still a fan of Zubrin's Mars Direct idea, but that's not likely at this point. Um, Elon Musk could do it. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? That's, Mars Direct is worth a show. 
book. It's worth a whole show. And uh, perhaps we'll do that uh, sometime soon coming up. Um, what we're looking at here, though, is NASA says, OK, we're going to be working with all these international partners. But international relations and international uh, circumstances being what they are, this landscape changes. We partnered with the Russians for more than a decade. Now we're kind of at daggers drawn because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, there were lots of countries who were working with Russia to provide their launch capacity to orbit. And that's basically not available anymore. They don't have the industrial capacity. They don't have the financial capacity. Uh, and parts that they need that they have to import, they don't have access to. And so a lot of other countries are going, gee, where are we going to go? How are we going to go to space now? So NASA says, you know what? We're going to have to be dealing with all these countries and all this changing political and socio landscape. And these space missions take years and years to develop. And uh, they involve thousands of people working across many countries. And we've got lots of different agencies now. Uh, so we have not only state-sponsored agencies like NASA, ESA, JAXA, uh, the Germans have their own space agency. And forgive me, guys, I'm not going to try to do all the acronyms here. Uh, the Germans have their own. The Indians have their own. The uh, Spanish just, just inaugurated theirs about a week ago. Uh, and the uh, United Arab Emirates has a space agency now. Um, and Canada participates in a space program with the United States. So there's all these agencies around the world. There's also corporate space agencies now, things like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and others. There are dozens of corporate space agencies whose business is to go to space, develop it economically, and make money. Um, NASA realizes that the alignment between these agencies, you can't do the sort of thing that we did with the Soviets for decades, where we're going to get there first, and we're developing this secret program, and we have this special rocket, and uh, trying to outcompete and outclass each other. Now we're looking at we're all going to Mars and to Venus. How are we going to not spend millions of dollars duplicating other people's work? Because that seems like a really bad idea. Even if you pulled it off successfully, I bet your taxpayers wouldn't be exactly happy with you. Well, didn't the Japanese do that like a year ago? What are we doing? Copying off of them? Or are we behind their program? What's the deal? And so we have to avoid overlapping scientific missions. And there are projects, there are projects that may be too expensive for one nation. We talk about establishing a permanent lunar base on the moon or on Mars. Um, you know what? That's going to take a lot of money and effort over decades. And uh, maybe putting all your eggs in one geopolitical ba basket is not the best idea. The NASA document, the M to M document here talks about, no, <laughs> sorry, I have, I have a partner here. Uh, my service dog pal Parker is coming up and <laughs> wanting to be on camera. Uh, anyway, they speak of enabling resilience in human spaceflight over time, across budget cycles, and across administrations. That was a firework to me. Sentil, welcome, my friend. Uh, that was a firework to me, the idea that they're thinking, oh, we need to do this across budget cycles. Sure, because budget cycles fluctuate, the economy fluctuates, but across administrations, yeah. Um, if you've been a fan of space exploration over the last uh, several decades, you see routinely uh, something one administration puts up as a goal or a project, the next administration cuts. And it's almost, you almost see someone standing off to the side and saying, this is why we can't have nice things. Uh, it's just funny. NASA refers to what they're doing now 
as creating a wireframe or an architecture, an overall uh, architecture. The wireframe is, to quote NASA, an architectural structure that connects space exploration projects, programs, and NASA mission directorates in a meaningful way. This is really, they're really talking about how do we organize an agency to go to space? Rockets go to space, agencies make that possible. How do we have an agency that is successful at this endeavor, this thing we want to do, which is space exploration? And they do go through and they do give you a whole set of um, strategy definitions. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, but they talk about the difference between endeavor, goal, and objective. Uh, and um, endeavors are near tools are set by an organization to achieve its vision and they're quite broad. Objectives are quite specific. Uh, oh yes, Paul has put them up, thank you. They're on this. This week's uh, show document, which you can download from the Explore uh, Scientific website. Look for the Explore Alliance page. Um, so we've got a statement here, and they're basically saying, here's how we think. The systems engineering, an interdisciplinary approach to designing, integrating, and managing complex systems over their life cycles. Uh, strategy, vision, and then the wireframe, the architectural structure that connects projects, programs, and entities in a meaningful way. So we're looking at this and we're saying, ah, so they're thinking really globally over the next several decades. And this diagram is really showing you their plan. Will this be the most efficient plan? Almost certainly not. It's a, uh, it's a very big organization now and not as flexible as it was half a century ago, much like many of us. Um, but uh, we may see private space exploration efforts leapfrogging over what big government efforts do because a small, uh, relatively speaking, small organization like SpaceX run by a single individual with a singular vision, and that type of an organization could put people on Mars far faster than a government organization from any country could do so. So then we come to another interesting thing, a section of the document they called, why go? Why go? Why go to Mars? Why go to the moon? Why go to these places? And Again, I was expecting something far more raw, raw space, raw, raw science sort of thing. But NASA, again, surprises me. And they basically put forward the idea that human space exploration present a value proposition to all of humanity. So it's worth something to you and to me and to everyone to have people exploring space no matter what country or what source of origin who put them there doesn't matter it has value to everyone and that's what nasa is trading on there's the little diagram you've got there <clears throat> and so they say this whole value proposition has three major pillars <coughs> science inspiration and national posture, which I find uh, very interesting. It's one of those things that I expected them to believe, but not to say, I suppose the best way to say that. And they have a lovely little Venn diagram there. It's worth taking a look at it. <clears throat> and the Venn diagram shows uh, for things like uh, science, the human research, heliophysics, planetary science, biological, astrophysics, and then we get into national posture, things like advances in uh, space and technology, uh, climate, um, and global influence, international relationships, and then inspiration, things like careers, preserving humanity, cultural enrichment, 
having a part in global leadership, having a voice there. Achieving things like this means that when you speak, people listen because you've done mighty things. So it's really something there. And they really are quite blunt by positioning this Mars to Moon strategy. This is our plan for longevity and success in spite of whatever screw ups uh, are perpetrated in the meantime by people who control our funding and the government and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so NASA is looking at this and we don't want these goals to be subject to anybody's particular whims or to leadership overhauls. That's really smart in a particular way uh, because when somebody says, oh no, I want to go here instead. Uh, you can make a whimsical, well, let's land in this crater instead of that one sort of a statement. And if you have the power to put it in place, you have no idea the amount of work you've just created, the amount of work you've just that's been done that you've just thrown away, uh, how much waste you've created in both time and money. <clears throat> and so they recognize we don't want this subject to whims but we don't want to be subject to leadership overhauls either. Uh, we're going here, we're right, and uh, please don't interfere with us. And we're going to structure this so you can't screw around and, and mess about with our program. Just a tiny bit of humorous in there maybe. Um, although I understand it's our ball, you'll only mess up the game, go away. Uh, I understand how they feel. <coughs> So basically they're saying, this is kind of a, uh, uh, what a platonic, the philosopher king. They say, basically we're going to set top level goals and objectives. We're going to set them. We, NASA, the deciders, we will set these and uh, these top level goals and objectives will determine how everything else flows downhill and away from here. So basically according to the document, these goals, determine the what platform and what are we going to do the what platform has to be detailed enough that we can say objectively yes we were successful no we weren't uh nasa has these success landmarks that it tells you every time this robot is designed for a 90-day mission on the surface of mars this helicopter is supposed to fly five missions with maybe an extra six if it gets that far. Uh, the helicopter has done 50 missions now. Um, and they give you this, here's our, here's our goals. And if we get this much done, we're going to be successful. And generally, NASA's science goals have been, um, their stated goals have been very conservative. Oh, if, if we can do this little bit, then we'll be a success and they generally accomplish uh, much greater things. Like I said, I still want a car that works like one of the Mars rovers. It has a 90 day warranty, but it lasts 14 years. Um, yeah, I want a car like that. Um, so these things have to be detailed enough. You can tell when you succeed and when you don't, they have to be rigorous enough so we can set achievable goals you want your goals not to be just things like we're going to colonize mars which sounds great and grandiose and dashing and heroic but you know what there's a hell of a lot of details in between here and where we are and where that day will bring us uh so we need to set achievable goals if our goals are wild pie in the sky ideas well that's nice but it doesn't really Give us what we need in terms of planning. We need to plan for achievable things. Finally, we need to be consistent. Our motivation and future exploration tech trajectory have to withstand the challenges of time, technology, and outside influences. So here NASA says we need to be doing things which are going to look just as interesting and just as important 10, 20, 30 years from now as they do today. 
we're going to have to be doing things that uh, are still reasonable to pursue, even if technology improves and changes greatly. Maybe we'll come back with a better gadget and redo the experiment, but we need to be doing stuff that even if we waiting for new technology doesn't make sense. And finally, outside influences. If other countries say, oh, we're doing that, or some, you know, one uh, political action committee or another says, wait, no, uh, craters on the moon have rights. You can't land a spacecraft there. Uh, you have to resist these outside influences and, uh, you know, stay on target, as the uh, guy in the Star Wars movie says. Stay on target, stay on target. And so uh, they have the how platform. We've seen the why and the how platform basically becomes a NASA mission directorate. And they're the people who have to decide how we accomplish all these goals. And so they have to deal with technology development. These folks in the NASA mission directorates, if you've got a mission directorate that says, you know, go uh, find a habitable place for an extended base, extended state base on Mars. Well, okay, you've got a job to do, but you're going to have to deal with a lot of development along the way. Why? Because nobody's ever done this before. It's brand new. You may need new materials. Gee, what kind of materials are we going to use on Mars? A place where the average temperature is 50 or 60 below zero, 100 below zero, isn't unknown, and uh, no oxygen in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, low pressure, uh, the winds, the abrasive particles uh, of uh, dust particles flowing at 100 kilometers an hour or better. So we really don't build for those sort of conditions on Earth. And if we build cheaply or poorly and the system fails, people die. So we have to make sure that uh, we do this right. We need new mechanical technology. Uh, there's studies which talk about an inflatable habitat. Uh, I like this one because I routinely work with an inflatable uh, planetarium. Uh, the university owns this big inflatable planetarium made by the nice folks at Star Lab. And uh, this thing's, I don't know, uh, five meters in diameter and about three meters high, and it's a hemispherical dome. And you hook it up to a fan, and it inflates itself. And there's proposals for long-term habitats where you land a module and it inflates itself. That way, when the lander with people arrives, there's an inflated habitat, warm and with atmosphere ready to welcome them. Uh, so new mechanical technology, rovers, uh, the conditions on the moon, two weeks of darkness, two weeks of daylight, freezing cold, blistering hot. Uh, new scientific technology. Um, sometimes we develop new experiments and we need to know how to do them and develop technology for that. Sometimes it's a matter of simply improving the technology we've already got, sending in the next mission a better spectrometer than went on the last mission, a better camera, and so on. And finally, new propulsion and power technologies. This is not just technology to get out to space faster, which is crucial because right now, six months to Mars, if we could cut that to six weeks, cut it by a factor of four, that cuts down not only the number of time, <coughs> excuse me, the amount of time that astronauts spend in space exposed to radiation, but the amount of food we must take with us, the complexity of the systems, we get to land on Mars and have that much more time for exploration. If our total mission time is supposed to be X number of months, and we can cut down from six months each way in travel to, oh, gee, three months total travel there and back, uh, we've just given ourselves another nine months of exploration time, potentially. So lots of interesting things in propulsion and power. The next part of the document, and this was a... Uh, a series of revelations, it really was. And basically they're talking about 
Systems Engineering Risks. And I'm thinking when I saw the title, oh, this is going to be what happens when you build things improperly and they break. Or in space, they leak atmosphere and you know your navigation is haywire and you can't get home. But no, they're not talking about that at all. They're really still talking about administratively. What are the risks to our administrative process? Their quote, for an engineering system, that's an organization or a directorate to build a spacecraft to go to Mars, uh, it's important to recognize risks that can impede progress or make the process crumble. And so what they're really talking about is what messes things up on your trip to Mars. And uh, the trip to Mars is, is much like any iceberg. They say, oh, the iceberg, only the tip protrudes out of the water and this big mass is underneath. Well, when we see the shiny spacecraft that lands on Mars and people hop out, that's the tip of the iceberg to a gigantic organization which is unseen behind them. So they talk about external ideas uh, and engineering risks, and they talk about things like external pressures. External pressures amounts to uh, people in it for their own gain or their own company's gain or their nation's gain, as opposed to you're in it for the mission. Uh, thinking like our product must be part of this mission, as opposed to we must have the best product on this mission for its ultimate success. Uh, unless you use my solution, I'm going to impede the process. This is the kind of external pressure, me first, team last sort of risk factor that NASA recognizes here. And certainly anybody who's worked on any kind of a team project at work uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, as a teacher, with students doing group projects for science and other classes, Book says, cut the pork. Yes, indeed, cut the pork. Uh, and that's part of what this is, Book. That is, that is indeed part of what this is, uh, is cutting out the pork. But what it really amounts to is having everybody focused on the end goal. I will say, when I look back at the Apollo era, and I was a boy at the time, okay, I'm not that old, uh, but when we look back at the Apollo era, we saw NASA sending the astronauts out like rock stars, not just to go see the public, but to go see as many of the thousands and thousands and thousands of workers who were working on different bits and pieces to put this spacecraft together to send these fellows out into space and onto the moon. The thinking was, if you're a worker at a plant making docking rings for the spacecraft and an astronaut comes and shakes your hand and says, I appreciate your hard work because you know, if your docking ring fails, I don't reconnect and I die. And we're all in it as Americans for this great goal. And I appreciate your hard work, individual worker. I appreciate your hard work making this important part of my rocket that's going to send me and by proxy all of America into space. And this idea of, oh, we're all in it for the end goal. But NASA says that's a fragile sort of a situation and it's hard to create and it's, it's fragile. It falls apart easily. So we need to guard against these things. Um, the next one comes up. And I'm surprised they put this at number two, or though maybe putting it at number one would have been not a nice message. Insufficient funding. And if we talk about insufficient funding, what are we talking about? Well, gosh, everybody knows. Um, we want you, a uh, scientist says, we want to send an astronaut team to Mars to dig in the soil and look for bacteria. And politicians say, wow, that sounds really exciting, a thing for America to do, or for Europe to do, or China to do, or whoever. And then uh, how much money will this cost, says somebody. The accountants always ruin the party. And then 
the space agency lays out their budget and anyone who's watched governments building anything know that this is going to be somewhere between 20, maybe optimistically 50% of the real cost, but they give you a number. Here you go. It's going to cost us a billion dollars. Fine. A billion dollars. Well, then they fund it and you start building it. And this is, it's not like, it's not like you go down to the Ford store and say, I would like me an F-150 truck and I want it exactly this way. And the Ford dealer takes your check and says, okay, bub, it'll be a few months until your truck comes to the front of the line and we build your truck and we'll leave you know. <clears throat> well, these kind of NASA goals put those kind of production chain delays to shame. NASA people can be talking about missions which span a decade or more. Some NASA, NASA principal investigators I've talked to uh, talk about, oh, uh, we were talking about this idea when I started at NASA 30 years ago, and eventually I rose through the ranks as this project gained in prominence, and I eventually became the PI, and this is, project essentially has been running my entire career. That's a long-term long -term goal. And if the funding gets cut in the middle, then you get another unique problem. And we'll talk about it in detail later on, but uh, you get this unique problem of how am I, what am I gonna do now I've started, can I finish anything with what they've left me? So funding is an issue. Overly broad or changing goals. Anyone who's worked in a company <coughs> has seen this sort of, a, of an issue. Excuse my cough, spring, hay fever, pollen. Uh, so we're talking about uh, overly broad goals or changing goals. So one of the problems is, the actual scientific and engineering teams underneath the directorate, if they have too much room for interpretation, then they build what they want instead of maybe what you need or what you can afford. And the other thing NASA points out is whatever visions and goals you have, they must be robust enough to withstand challenges. If the next administration comes in and they don't like what the last person said about space exploration and they come to challenge you, well, last guy supported this and we don't like him anymore so why should we keep funding you nasa says we need to design our goals and our vision so they're independent of whoever is supporting us at the minute which i think is a wise strategy and they also point out that when you change goals it requires a hard reset if the goal isn't land a weather station on Mars North Pole, but land an ice sampling and analysis science station on Mars North Pole. When you change those goals, you basically force everybody to go back. You throw out a lot of work you've already done and paid for, and you have to rebuild from scratch time, money, resources, development. And so changing goals are really, really expensive. And I'm very excited to see NASA acknowledge that as an upfront problem that needs to be dealt with. And then we get a uh, then we get a section that NASA calls, and I quote, "unhelpful cultural behaviors." And I'm like, "Ooh, I don't think I could say that in my classroom today." <laughs> you people are exhibiting unhelpful cultural behaviors. No, I'm pretty sure I couldn't say that, but. They talk about it as it's almost like a tribalism amongst your engineering and scientific teams. And people, again, fear, what if our part of the program gets cut? We'll lose our jobs. So we must do things to make sure our part of the program is indispensable. You can't go without us. We're like lug nuts. We're small, we're insignificant, but Nah, we're not an option. You got to take us along. The thing is, again, this is that long term, everybody's focused on the long term goal and not on their place in it. It's that same sort of process again. Uh, <laughs> NASA refers to it in their document as small engineering and science groups creating stovepipes. 
And I don't know, maybe if there's an engineer out in the audience, they'll tell us if that's a real term. I haven't heard of it. But they define stovepipes and they basically say, oh, <clears throat> we're building things where um, this certain uh, product has to be built and completed and we've spent so much on it now, we can't stop, we must go forward. Whether or not it's actually of use in the end doesn't matter because it's people basically protecting their own jobs. Um, poor and restricted communications. NASA talks about the idea that emergencies or international uh, circumstances, Ukraine, uh, international circumstances might cause you to have poor or restricted communications. Sometimes space agency folks are all like pals, but the governments that support them are not so friendly. And so if my government and your government are having stressful times, it may make the scientific communication between us difficult. And that's a real problem. And once again, uh, they call this unhelpful cultural behaviors. Um, but they also talked about in this document, a problem is called capability based exploration. This is where uh, you make plans that are not resilient. We're going to design a giant project. Goodness, we're going to land a mobile scientific laboratory the size of a double wide mobile home on Mars and every once in a while it's going to get up on legs and walk around to different locations and it'll house all this great stuff. And the project gets started but then the cuts, the cuts, the cuts, the cuts. And eventually what you end up doing is you have, oh, well, we worked on this part of the instrument, but we can't afford to send it now. So it's all developed. We'll stick it over here on a shelf. Oh, let's shrink our instrument. If we're smaller, we can fly on a smaller rocket. How much does it cost to redesign our spacecraft to fit on a smaller rocket? Well, the, but that means we can cut and we start cutting, cutting, cutting. And what we've really done is we've abandoned the objective-based approach. Our objective is to land human beings on Mars who can explore and learn about Mars geological history and search for signs of life there. And instead of an objective where we're building toward an objective, we're working toward an objective, our team's goal is focus on the objective. Rather than that, friends, what we're actually doing is we're saying, oh, well, here's how much we've got for the party. What can we afford? You've been to those kind of parties, right? A couple old cans of sardines, some Ritz crackers, and some 7-Up mixed with uh, lime jello for a punch. And there we go. Uh, a few party streamers. This is what we could afford. We're playing mixtapes now. We didn't hire a band. NASA said... That's a really poor approach. It generally gives mediocre scientific income outcomes. And it's also riskier. Such missions fail more often because they're cobbled together without a core vision. And their science return is often significantly less per dollar spent than on uh, object-based missions. So we're getting some interesting insights into how the planners at NASA are seeing their role and their attempts to structure themselves extra governmentally. So no matter what happens with politics, we're protected, we're safe. Um, that's some of the exact kind of unhelpful tribal thinking that they were talking about. And I can sabotage projects, but okay, what's justifiable on one level may not be on another. Then they go into methodology principles. <clears throat> And again, they're saying, we're really talking about a strategy here. This isn't an engineering document. This is a strategy document. How are we going to plan to outmaneuver changes in funding, changes in government, changes in administration, changes in what's scientifically popular right now, and get our objectives accomplished over the next few decades. <clears throat> and they basically said, 
Well, we have to have five interrelated methodology principles if we're going to make this whole thing work. And the very first principle, the very first top level one is an objective based approach to space exploration. NASA has, you know, they've seen the good times, they've seen the bad. <clears throat> Essentially, NASA is telling us from their 70 years of experience is that you have to have an objective space. The catch as we can and do it we can afford type approach really is wasteful of money and material and effort. <clears throat> so we have to establish objectives. When the last Curiosity or, excuse me, Perseverance rover landed on Mars, the parachute was coded in Morse code, dare mighty things, from a quote from a speech by Teddy Roosevelt, dare mighty things. <clears throat> NASA says you have to dare mighty things. You have to have big top level goals. That's going to guide everything else, because if you don't, you don't get anywhere. Next, consistency and purpose, which comes in three parts. The first is technical resilience. We need to have uh, mechanics and science, which are second to none, sound, rigorous technical analysis. We can't do slipshod, we don't care about the science, oh, just fly the shuttle, I'm sure the O-ring will be fine sort of mentality. We can't do that. When we do that, things explode and people die. It's a bad day for everyone. So we need to have technical resilience. <clears throat> Second, we need to have financial resilience. Our wireframe strategy helps us plan for financial changes <coughs> and maximize the opportunities. They're basically saying we have a strategy to continue along in the minimum budget case, and we always have our shovel-ready projects for when the money becomes available. Because money in government and in real life is fleeting. You have this opportunity, you have the money, do you have everything ready to spend it on? Can you make good use of the funds right now? Because something's just happened and the funds are available right now. So the last one, the, the consistency parts, is political resilience. And again, NASA's been bitten by this snake. Uh, a concrete value system, well-crafted goals, clear architectural planning to make the program resilient across political administrations. They want a program which is so brilliant, popular, productive and engaging that everybody will say, no, no, we have to keep going. And NASA takes this from the days of Apollo. President Kennedy proposed the trip to the moon. We choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. He was dead a few months later and his project became this martyr thing. Uh, we're going to do it for Jack because he died in the cause. And away we go. And we saw the Apollo system sail through uh, another decade of American politics, um, basically unscathed until it finally all came crashing down in the 70s. But NASA says, you know what? We want things that are like that in that they are so popular obvious and important that everybody says, yeah, let's do it. They want the entire nation behind it because then you have political resilience. It's just like social security. Nobody wants to mess with that. Let's mess with the old age pension. No, that's very unpopular. They, NASA wants their program to be like that. So popular with everyone that everybody gets angry when you mess with it. Next, a unity of purpose. Again, this is an Apollo era lesson. From political sources down to the workforce, 
everybody from the front end to the back must share the same vision and purpose. America is going to put men on the moon before the Soviets because it's important for our national defense and our prestige, and every American is behind this goal. And at the time, the moon program was popular in the way that nothing else in my lifetime has been. It was in schools, it was on television, it was on the news, it was worked into jokes, in music, in song. Basically, if you were alive in the mid to late 60s, you would have had to put your head pretty far down in the sand to avoid being daily exposed to the drumbeat of space exploration and the excitement of it, the drama, and everybody was pulling for it. When everyone has clarity on their own role and they stand ready to do more when the chance presents itself, then you've got a program that runs on rails that is going to be successful in spite of outside interference. And finally, NASA reminds us that communication is the lifeblood that drives a reinforcing cycle for all our other principles. So enhanced communication <clears throat> has to be one of our methodology principles. From there, and this is the last little bit, I know it's been getting a little thick today with the philosophy and ideas. It'll be more hands-on space stuff next week. They talk about recurring tenants, common themes, <clears throat> and these recurring themes in the Mars to Moon document. First, international collaboration. Second, collaboration with the US space industry. <clears throat> Third, getting the crew back safely to Earth with minimum adverse health impacts. Number three, I don't know if that makes the folks on board feel good or not. Number four, maximizing the crew time available for science and engineering. I'm sure that makes the crew happy. When practical design systems for maintenance, reuse, and recyclability. I think that's just good common sense engineering practice anyway. <clears throat> Number six, responsible exploration. Conduct your activities for peaceful purposes consistent with international treaties. Uh, no nuclear silos on the far side of the moon and stuff like that. Uh, seven, interoperability. You want to make sure all the uh, widgets you use are interchangeable within programs as far as you can go. Common technical operations and processes throughout equipment and crew training. Somebody who's training on one spacecraft should be able to go in and operate another. If you have a problem with one component that burns out from a ship, you should be able to take something from its companionship and swap the part and you're good to go. Number eight, leveraging low earth orbit infrastructure. It's interesting that they acknowledge that there is a low earth orbit infrastructure, but certainly with Starlink and various other CubeSat companies and all sorts of other things, there is indeed a low earth orbit infrastructure. Uh, including funeral services, by the way. Uh, and finally, number nine, foster the expansion of the U.S. space economy beyond Earth orbit. They recognize that right now the Earth's space economy is in low Earth orbit. They said we need to expand that frontier and get us out beyond LEO and into deeper space. So I hope this has been a exciting and interesting deep dive into the mind of NASA. And I'm sure we could see very similar things from ESA and various other organizations. Uh, there's a nice link on the show notes for today where you can download the document. And I must say it is a very pretty document. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. The graphics, the colors, the pictures, it's just awesome. It's everything you would expect from NASA. And uh, so there we go. We're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about, well, gee, what's some of the real science? What particular science missions are in NASA's Mars to Moon program? And what kind of exploration will we be seeing in the decades to come? 
We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Again, if you have questions or comments, you're welcome to contact me, <clears throat> astronomyforeducators at gmail.com. I do answer all the email I get there. And thank you all for showing up. And I hope you'll join us again next week at the same time. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.